Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Six Days Spent by Luana Erlock. When private investigator Milas Gray gets a call from the wife of a high-profile Pentagon official, he assumes it's about their appointment to discuss a possible stalker. It's not. It's about her husband. He's just been murdered. Milas agrees to investigate the murder, even though he's supposed to help Whitney find a place to live in the next six days. Can he do both? As it turns out, finding a killer and finding a house have a lot in common. Well, welcome to uh, The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I'm so glad you joined me. Today's guest is Luana um, Ehrlich. I think I got that right. A USA Today best-selling yes. author, as well as a freelance writer, minister's wife, and former missionary to Costa Rica and Venezuela. So welcome to my show. Thank you, Sarah. I'm enjoying being here. And I get, did I get it right? Did I get your name right? This is, this is the burning question that well, I have. It, it's very close. It's Luana okay. Early. Luana, Luana Early. Luana uh, Yeah, we were talking. Very, so, very close. Thank you. I do my best. You know, um, I think I didn't have phonics as a child, and it just really messed me up for life. So <laughs> I have the hardest right. time with I, names. I, I, and I, the same, I have the same problem, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't I like to pronounce know. words I don't have heard before. <laughs> so have, so here, here's the question I have. So you do, do you ever do, this is what I ha- what's, this is what happens to me. I think of a word, I'm, I'm, in, I'm talking to someone, the perfect word comes to mind, and I'm like, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So I have to like find, scramble and find a synonym because I'm like, I'm not sure I'm going to say this right. And it's going to get right. all garbled. And it's so frustrating. But um, that's just where I am. <laughs> but, you know, I think that helps us build our vocabulary because I was a little bit of a stutter when I was in elementary. Mm. And so... I knew words that would make me stutter, so I had to think of another one, you know, or come up mm. with another one. So, so maybe that helps us have a better vocabulary. I'm, I'm going to go. I like your explanation. I, I'm going to go with that. We makes us have a better vocabulary. I like that. And as writers, of course, we want a very wide vocabulary. My mom called it, though. She, just, she said I had a reading vocabulary because I would read books above my grade level. I just I was an avid reader, and... So I would come across these words, and I would know what they mean, or I'd look them up, and I'd be able to figure that out. But pronounce it, you know, I didn't know how to pronounce them. So anyway, right. I, <laughs> the things we writers worry about, I tell you, readers, <laughs> with listening to this, it's kind of crazy sometimes. So It is. Um, it is. But it's fun because it's all about words. I always tell my kids, you want to talk about English, English assignments, history classes, I'm all in. Talk about math, and I'm going to leave because I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing Me about math. I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm the same way. <clears throat> All right, so we're, let's let's we'll get off the fact that uh, neither of us can pronounce anything and go on to books because that that's a better <laughs> that's a better fit that's I think right. for us. That is a better so, um, so the um, now you you're writing a series with a yes. first person male protagonist. So let, let's talk about that. I mean, I love that you're doing this. Um, I, love, I love my male protagonist. Um, I don't write first person. I prefer third. But I do love my male protagonist. I always find it fun to get in their heads and do it. But writing from first person must be a little bit more of a challenge. So, so let, let's, let's talk about that. Okay. Um, yes, and I think I write in that, in that way as a male protagonist because uh, when I was growing up, I was about 11 years old, and my, I saw that my dad, the books he was bringing home from the library, mostly spy fiction and mysteries, that um, they looked very interesting to me, much more interesting kind of than the Bobsy Twins I'd finished reading. So <laughs> I uh, asked him if I could start read, you know, if I could read some, you know, some, one that looked good. And I was hooked on that genre from that moment on but the unique thing about my dad was that he never 
read a female author. Never. He just, that was Ah. something he would never do. So most, as you would imagine, male authors write uh, male characters. And I think that it never occurred to me then when I started writing and this character came to mind, this Titus Ray, that I would ever write in anything uh, but as a male protagonist and in first person because I love reading in first person and my dad did also. So I think that's kind of the story behind why I do it. But I believe, you know, it's it's more a, a, of an intimate kind of um reading experience I believe if you're if you're reading in first person and um, I think you can present your protagonist thoughts and feelings uh, more directly maybe to the reader uh, it perhaps creates more of a, of a connection uh, between the character <coughs> and the reader mm-hmm. and um, I think it helps build suspense you know uh, because you, the the protagonist doesn't exactly know what's going on, and that helps the reader not know what's going on. And uh, I just I enjoy it because I think it makes um, the experience much more engaging. Yeah, I no, really I mean, found I... it that much of a challenge. Uh, I guess okay. uh, I, I <clears throat> thought about that because. Um, you know, I think that you are, you're still portraying the same human emotions, you know, fear and doubt and ambition, joy, whatever. And mm-hmm. so I think that, that 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 isn't too much more difficult than writing uh, the female character. <clears throat> right. I mean, how, whoever we write, we have to be authentic, Um you know, about that, about their their hopes and dreams and emotions and reactions to things. So I think that that's always been a challenge, whether you write first person, third person, and whatever point of view right. you write from. Um, it's right. always important to do that. No, um, yeah, I mean, I read, just going back to what you read as a kid, because I always think it's fascinating, <laughs> um, I, I read a variety <laughs> of books too, you know, and I read like all the Agatha Christie books and then I moved on to, I read a lot of the um, Perry Mason books and, you know, I was reading right. everything, oh, anything yeah. I could get my hands on that was a mystery, that was a clean book. Westerns, right. I read a lot of Westerns too, I went through oh, a Western yeah. phase, right. Um, yes, right. You know, which right. Were, were almost exclusively male writers with male characters. Right, oh yeah, absolutely, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I admire yeah. I admire female authors who write in third person and write even female protagonists. I, I mean, because I don't, I think that that kind of fascinates me uh, uh, about it. You know, I think I've written I've, for 10 years in this genre as a male protagonist because I have three series. So, mm-hmm. so each of my three series is a male protagonist. So I, many times when I'm reading, you know, other authors' books, I just so admire the way that they do that. I'm just not sure I could ever do it now. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's what makes I th- what makes any genre, I think, fascinating because you can have all these different voices in it. You know, we can right. have your series yeah. with a first-person male protagonist. We can have my books, which are, I have male and female third-person points of view. And, you know, and we have other people who do a mix of first and third. I mean, there's just such a wide right. variety. I um, mean, some right. people are writing exclusively third-person, but only one point of view. Right. You know, so there's like yeah. a whole gambit of, of options out there and, um, you know, I like to read a bunch of different ones, um, and it's just, I think it just makes it fresh and interesting, and yeah, just kind of, I mean, right. it makes it that fun. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, I don't, it does make yeah. it fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you write first person. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how you write first person all the time. I'm like, no, no, thank you. <laughs> I'd rather do first. <laughs> oh, just good. just good. my personal well, I'm glad opinion. We're all different. <laughs> 
Yes. Yes. Yay. Yay for being different. Yay for being yes, different. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. So um, you mentioned that you've been writing for 10 years. Um, that's great. Um, and you published, you just published your 22nd books. Wow. You've been busy. How, how do you keep up that pace? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have kids at home, number one. <laughs> My husband's retired and he really helps me around the house. And, um, you know, I just love to write. I really do. It's, it's a joy for me to get up every day and anticipate writing. So um, I'm not a very fast writer. I'm not, I mean, I, the thought of like writing 5,000 words in one day is just mind-blowing to me and even beyond that. But, you know, I usually set myself a goal every day of the of at least a thousand words, and somehow, if you keep doing that every day, a, a book comes out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little more to it than that, but <laughs> that is that. Yeah, that slow and steady. That that'll do it. That'll do it. So, yeah, I kind of. Um, I so so. You want to hear my my dream? My dream yes. is to like. <laughs> be on up in the mountains and snowed in, but I still had electricity so I could charge my computer, but I didn't have internet, which that was fine yeah. <laughs> for like okay. a couple of months yeah. a year out of the year just to, just to write. Nothing else I can do. <laughs> <laughs> but right, but right. Well, but right, you yeah. Know, uh, you do get the you you do get distracted. I, I do I do understand that. And I can't imagine if I had kids running around you know, some people can ride in any kind of environment, but I really like it more of a quiet place with no one around. And so maybe the mountain cabin would do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I do have, as my listeners know, I still I have uh, teenagers at home, and we're foster parents, so we currently have a, a autistic foster placement. He's in first grade, and... Um, you know, so there are there are challenges yeah. to finding writing Lots time. You know, and and I realize yeah. this is the season I'm in, and you know, still yes. still making it and you won't making it work. Be in that. Yes, you won't. And I will not be always. In no, I will. And that's that's. I think that's one of the things that should be an encouragement to us all that right. we're. You know, to think of life as seasons because we are not all stuck. We're not all stuck in the toddler stage with our kids. Even though sometimes if you have kids close together or have a lot at once, then, yeah, it right. feels like forever. But then you're you're past it, you're done, and then you're moving on to the next season and next season. And in each one, I think God has given us different things to do, different expectations, different abilities right. that we have. And I think right. it's important to kind of embrace that. Oh, absolutely, right? and, yes. And you even alluded to the seasons that I've had in my life that as a I've, you know, been a minister's wife. We were missionaries overseas. And I wasn't writing in any of those stages of my life other than some short article kind of thing. I mean, I would never have thought of writing a book. And mm. I, didn't have, I didn't really have that as my goal either, although the thought of being an author, I always, if I heard someone had written a book that I knew, I found myself always being very envious of that. But but I knew I didn't have the time to do that. You know, uh, my husband is a lead pastor, and I had a lot of responsibilities and teaching Bible studies and so forth. So, yes, you you never know how the Lord is going to open the door for you uh, to minister as an author. And I think that's what happened to me, that's for sure. And it will happen to you, too, probably. <laughs> you, yeah, I know, and I'm... Right, you know, well, and I always, I always look at time as, I mean, it's, it's not like a moving target, but there's just, there's just different, each day can be different. We have an idea of what we're going to do, and sometimes God says, yes, I think that's a fine plan, Sarah, and you're going to get this accomplished, and sometimes he says, "Uh uh-uh, I got other things to do, and whoo, there you go, and (laughs) there it is, there you go, there it is. There it is, and you know, learning to, you know, learning to be gracious in those moments. Learning to, um, you know, realize that God's plans are better than my plans, and even though it might not 
be fun to take care of a sick kid or this or that that you weren't expecting. But that's right. okay. It that's is. That's okay. It is. It sounds like you have a good attitude about this. I, I do my best because there's no point in getting all upset about it. <laughs> that just wastes no, more energy. Right. I don't exactly. have that much energy. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what is one thing that you would like readers to know besides that you write in first person about your books? What is one other thing? Um, we're almost at the end of our time. So let's, let's close with this last question. What is one thing you want readers to know about your books? I believe they need to know when they are reading each and every book, somewhere in the book has uh, the plan of salvation in it, every, mm. every book. <clears throat> and it's not um, in your face kind of thing, <clears throat> excuse me, but the, each of the protagonists is on a different uh, relationship or journey with the Lord, and uh, they're struggling, as we all do. And in the midst of that, I'm able to present the gospel. Uh, I think mm. that's the best. And that's the thing probably readers need to know when they go into one of my books. You don't see it immediately, maybe, but it's there. Ah, uh, Okay. That's great. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on my show. Well, thank you for having me, Sarah. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And listeners, please stay tuned for an excerpt from one of her latest books, Six Days Spent. Now an excerpt from Six Days Spent by Luana Erlock. It was Saturday morning, and I was feeling indecisive. Not so much about what to do, but about what to wear. I'd never been house hunting before, so I was clueless about the appropriate attire. Khakis? Jeans? Dress pants? On Saturdays, except when I was involved in an investigation, I usually slipped on a casual shirt and jeans to run errands or to lounge around the house. However, if I was running an investigation, I always dressed in slacks, a button-down shirt, and a sports jacket, unless the situation called for a disguise of some sort. I was the owner of Milus Gray Investigations in Washington, D.C., and after closing a major case yesterday, one that involved Senator Davis Allen, I was taking the day off. While I certainly deserve some time off— the main reason I wasn't working today was because Whitney Engel and I were spending the day together. Whitney, who arrived on Monday, was visiting me from my hometown of Columbia, Missouri. For the past several days, I'd been tied up with the Allen investigation, and Whitney, who was a professional photographer, had been taking pictures of kids for a fundraising brochure my church was putting together. Last night, after Whitney and I left a dinner party at the home of Nathan Lockett, my best friend, and Senator Allen's chief of staff, Whitney said she was ready to consider moving to D.C. This was a decision I'd been hoping she'd make ever since we both agreed that living closer to each other was the only way for us to know where our relationship was going. Personally, since I was in love with Whitney, I had an idea where I wanted our relationship to go— but at the same time, I realized we really didn't know each other all that well yet. Even though we met in Columbia, Missouri last October, we hadn't spent much time together since then, so her decision to move to Washington was exactly what I'd been praying for. Now, before she flew back to Columbia on Friday, she needed to find a place to live, which was why I'd made a phone call to Nina Rivers last night and asked her to locate a real estate agent who could start working with us immediately. Nina was my research analyst at MGI, someone who had an ability to find out anything about anyone. I was optimistic Nina would find an agent who could meet with Whitney and me today, which is why I decided to forego the casual Saturday attire and dress as if I were going to the office. Thus, when I came down for breakfast, I had on a white shirt and a pair of slacks. My clothing choice didn't escape the attention of my housekeeper, Mrs. Higby, who was in the kitchen cooking some scrambled eggs. The moment she saw me, she placed her hands on her hips and said, Oh, Milas, please tell me you're not going to go to the office today and leave poor Whitney here all by herself. I swiped a piece of bacon off the counter. 
Okay, I'm not going to the office today and leaving poor Whitney here all by herself. She smiled. That's good. You need to forget about work today, and the two of you just need to go have some fun together. Mrs. Higby tended to be a little bossy, but since her advice was usually well-intended, I found it easy to ignore her bossy side, for the most part. In reality, the two of us had enjoyed an amicable relationship ever since I met her when I moved into the house I received as part of the estate of my former employer, Theodore Mac McKinney. I met Mac while I was still in law school, and when I graduated, I eagerly accepted his invitation to join the McKinney Law Firm. Although he treated me as the son he never had, I was still shocked when I learned I was the sole heir of his estate after he passed away of a heart attack. I didn't particularly like being a lawyer, so I sold his law practice within a year of his death, although I kept his six-bedroom residence in the Wesley Heights section of Washington, as well as his substantial bank accounts and stock portfolio. I also retained the services of his housekeeper, Mrs. Higby, and his handyman, Joe Blondie. Having fun is definitely on my agenda today, Mrs. Higby, but it's hard for me to completely forget about work when Milas Gray Investigations only opened its doors two weeks ago. You said your receptionist is having trouble handling all your calls, so I'm sure you can afford to take a couple of days off. It was true. Because of a high-profile murder case that garnered a lot of attention, Milas Gray Investigations had enough clients to keep me and my two investigators, plus my surveillance crew, busy for the next several weeks. Starting my own private investigative agency had been my intention even before Mac passed away. But shortly after I sold his law practice, I received a call from Nathan Lockett asking me if I'd consider coming to work for Senator Allen as his chief investigator. Allen was the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and because of that role, he had his own investigative team to check out the backgrounds of the president's judiciary nominees, as well as look into his own personal matters and those of his colleagues. However, last month, after working for Senator Allen for six years, I finally submitted my resignation, purchased the four-story Lancaster building, hired staff, and launched Milas Gray Investigations, renaming the building the Greystone Center. Because Whitney had encouraged me to make this move, I invited her to come to Washington for a few days so I could show her my new office space, introduce her to my two investigators, Leslie Irving and Kyle Ford, and have her meet my surveillance crew as well as my administrative staff. Of course, that was just an excuse. My real objective was to convince her to move to Washington so we could be together. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.